Hey, good morning and welcome to Fellowship Online. My name is Joel Diaz. I'm the Connections Pastor and I'm thankful that you've chosen to worship with us today. Uh, while we're worshiping together, you're gonna have opportunities to give, pray, and to connect. You can do that by uh, scanning the QR code that's on your screen, or if you're watching on YouTube, go to the video description down below. And if you're watching on our website, you're gonna find those links right below the video player window. Well, again, welcome to Fellowship Online, and now let's worship God together. Am I here? Yeah, there we go. Good morning, my name is Jeff Wiggins. We are so glad you're here. Um, Fellowship Bible Church. We're a place where we want to proclaim the word of God boldly. We're also a church where we want to grow in our diversity and be multi-generational. And I mention that because this morning is our family service. You'll notice that we have a lot of our Youngsters, our middle school students, our grade school students, our high school students, we're glad you're with us. Welcome. Speaking of welcome, if you're new to fellowship, <clears throat> we'd like to get to know you. If you look on the back of your seat, of the seat back in front of you, there's a Q card, a QR symbol. This interweb stuff gets to me. Uh, <laughs> There's a QR code, you can scan that, and it'll connect you to a way to give us your information so that we can get to know you. I promise that we will not slam you and spam you with a lot of email. If you're watching online, please, there is a QR code there. There are other ways to give us your information. Again, we want to get to know you. As I was <clears throat> preparing this morning, talking about multi-generational, <clears throat> I thought about it, and this, as, as I was preparing and talking about the people online and the people that were here, I wanted to say those that are online and those that are live. Well, you're all alive. <clears throat> you're here, you know. So, because back in my day, and that's important, we would talk about, <clears throat> we would ask, is it live or is it Memorex? What was that? What was that? It was recording tape. Right. How many of you know what recording tape is? Yeah, a few I know don't. Anyway, thanks for being here. We want to proclaim the word of God. We want to be multi-generational and diverse. Uh, we want to connect with you. We also want you to know that we are careful and prayerful in the way the leadership um, uses your tithes and offerings. Again, you can give online. You can do through the QR code. You can go to our website, and there is a tab for giving. We also have uh, offering boxes by each door for those of us older people who like to write checks, and some of us even use hard currency. So that's available to you. One of the, also a thing we want to do, since we are multi-generational today, and they picked me, I think, because I'm a grandfather, um, is to do a little game. We want to have trivial pursuit. This is our trivial pursuit this morning. How many of you remember when trivial pursuit first came out? Okay. Now, one of the things I keep talking about back in our day if you hear me use the phrase, back in my day, you are to yell out, who cares? Okay, <laughs> let's try it. Back in my day. Okay, great. Um, we're going to have questions from 2000, 1964, 1984, and 2004. Now, don't look on your neighbor's papers, but if you get the question right, give yourself five points. If you get it wrong, deduct five points. And if you don't even answer, deduct one point. So that's how it works and that's how we're gonna keep score. So let's jump in. 
<clears throat> trivial pursuit questions from 1964, 1984, and 2004. Who led the British invasion? The Beatles, right. Right, you know, the younger people are always saying, why do you talk about the Beatles? <sighs> I know you get tired of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, if you, were, if you were older, back in my day, you would understand that joke. <clears throat> okay, who won the Nobel Prize in 1964? No, who won? <laughs> who won? Who won the Nobel Prize in 1964? Dr. Martin Luther King. That's right, Dr. Martin Luther King. Okay, who won the World Series in 1964? The Cardinals, we got a Cardinals fan here. Beat the Yankees four games to three. Now, unless you were from New York, you hated the Yankees. You know, at least that's how it was back in my day. Um, <clears throat> all right. 1984. What made for the consumer computer was launched in 1984? The Apple, the Macintosh, the original Macintosh. What was the title of Kevin Bacon's hit movie? How many of you can dance like Kevin Bacon did? If you say yes, deduct 20 points, okay? <laughs> now, are you keeping score? You know, you have to keep score. Okay. In 2004, this one's a gibby. What was the name of NASA's orbiter and probe that entered Saturn's atmosphere? The Cassini Huygens Orbiter and Probe. If you have that correct answer, give yourself 100 points. <clears throat> now, let me, let me hope I get this right. The game show where people who know how to spell Cassini Huygens Orbiter, what is Jeopardy? See, the answer has to be in the form of a question. Okay, how many of you had a score more than 10? Okay, we got one. Anybody, 20, anybody have 20? We got 20. Anybody, 25? 20, I feel like I'm doing a, she had 25. Oh, over there, who had 30? Anybody, wave real big. All right, there we have 30. Okay, Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction <laughs> and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, what was one of the most important things for the people in this room that happened in 2004. Most of our seniors were born. That is to be celebrated. High school seniors, you made it. You made it. <laughs> Let me leave you with this. Seniors, as you go to the next step and the next step and the next step, go with the Lord Jesus Christ. Go, grow in your relationship with him and your dependence upon him. That's where you'll find success. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. Father, I pray that we would have ears to hear, that we would have open minds. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would inspire every word that Jason shares with us. Lord, don't let us leave without growing in our relationship with Jesus. And it's in his name that I pray, amen.
good. Amen. Amen. I said the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. It is a joy to be here with you all this morning. You may take a seat. I'd like to invite all of our children to come join me up here on stage for a kid's sermon. So if you would like, come on up here, meet me up here. Uh, I'm so grateful for Jeff Wiggins, uh, who has been a pastor to this church and to me in all the ways that he served us and uh, uh, I was chuckling because there was one person in both services who got the last question right. Um, and uh, as soon as I heard Cassini come out of this person's mouth, I was astonished. Uh, but thanks, Jeff, for bringing the fun this morning, brother. He also brought this Roman broadsword this morning. And it's very sharp. Do you guys know what this is? It's a sword. And this one especially is very sharp. So I'm going to sit it way back here, okay? That is an actual sword. And so is this. You guys, I want you to feel how heavy this is. This is not sharp, by the way. And I just want you to feel the hilt. All right, you guys feel that? What might you use a sword for? To defend yourself? In a war. Yeah, in a war. That's a good, that's a very good answer. Yep, in a war. No, I'm, that, you can't hold it. You could, you could, yeah, use it to catch bad guys. Uh-huh, you could do that. 
Yeah, you could. Now that sword is heavy, right? Like it's got some weight to it. It's not light at all. Can you feel that? Yeah, pretty ornate. So do you guys, um, do you guys ever get scared? Does anybody in here ever get scared? Yeah, yeah I get scared sometimes. So sometimes Miss Courtney sends me to take the trash outside and it's dark outside. <laughs> and, and so I run outside real fast because sometimes I can get a little afraid. You feel that? So one of the cool things that God does is that he tells us that when we get afraid, that we actually can do something about it. And when we get afraid, we can fight that fear. And one of the realities about being a Christian is that we, if Jesus is our king, we have a very real enemy. Do you guys know who our enemy is? It's Satan. Satan. Yeah. And, and our very real enemy wants to do everything he can to discourage and to distract. And for us, it's really important to remember that we are not fighting each other. So your friend who sit next to you, they're not your enemy, but the real enemy is Satan himself. And the question is, how do we fight? Do you guys know how we fight? How do we fight Satan? Anybody know? Okay, maybe we don't box him. Yes, Silas, we fight with God. Yes, sir. Uh, we, we, also, we also have um, the power to believe in God. Yes, we do. We do have the power to believe in God. That's right. Yes, ma'am. God in Christ did rise from the dead. He did. That is one of the ways that we fight. Yes, sir. That's right. So heaven and hell, they are very real. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you want to touch? Okay, here you go. I'm sorry. Hey, you see, you feel, yeah, there you go. No, you can't hold it. So Paul tells us, so Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter six, that he says to take up the whole armor of God, the whole armor. He says to put on your helmet, put on your breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the gospel shoes of peace. And then he says, take up the sword of the spirit. And he says, take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So what does that mean? That means that God has given us tools to fight with, namely this. What is this? You guys know what this is? The Bible, Paul says that the Bible is the sword of God. And this is what we use to fight. We fight to, to believe, to have faith. We also don't fight one another. But when we get afraid, we use the Bible to fight our fear. So when we get afraid or when we get a little uncomfortable, I want us to remember that we don't fight the enemy alone. We fight with all of God's power by his word. Now, here's the last thing. This sword is kind of heavy. So come here. You want to hold this? Okay, can, can, you, can you hold, is that real? Oh, wow, that's heavy, right? It's not heavy, you're really strong. You're really strong, you wanna, okay. So the sword is heavy. Oh, good job, thank you. Okay, that's enough, okay. Okay, one more, one more. Okay. So the thing about the sword is this sword can be heavy and so is God's word. But the good news is that we don't fight on our own strength. We fight with the strength that God supplies. Okay. Now let's pray. So when we, as we leave, let's remember to fight using God's word. Okay. Not actual swords. That's a good distinction. So let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you so much that your word, it guards and guides us, it protects us, but also it is the tool by which you beat back the darkness and take ground from the enemy. I pray for these children, that your word would become precious to them, that your word would become a salve for them, that it would be the source that they would run to for comfort and wisdom and guidance. Would you grow and raise up a generation of children who not only love your word, but love to do what's in it. So help us, help these children as we continue to worship your great name. We love you. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Go back to see, go back to your seats. Go back and find mommy. Okay, you can hold it after church. Um, we are so grateful to be a church that has for 40 plus years stood upon God's word and will continue to stand on God's word. And when we see our children um, before the Lord and before the word of God, um, this is what we're imparting unto them. 
So I want to invite you all to stand with me as we continue to worship the Lord in song. Let's give God a hand praise for our children this morning. <laughs> What's awesome about God is he fights our battles for us. Anybody know that today? We come prepared, but he fights for us. And we serve a God who can do the impossible. So let's worship this morning as we sing this song. a 
God like that. Let's give him some praise this morning. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good. I don't know about y'all. That's good. Yes, 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 yes. He, 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 he ain't never lost. Do you understand? I, I don't know what you came in this room with, but I need you to know that he has never lost. I don't know what you're trusting and believing him for. And it may be too big for you, but I need you to know he has never lost. In fact, he's never been challenged. He's unrivaled because he's unmatched. He's indefatigable. You can't outrun him. You can't outpace him. You can't outchase him. You can't catch him unless you want to be caught because he has never lost. I'm by myself this morning. That's okay. I don't know what y'all came to do, but I'm going to have some church. He ain't never lost. He's never lost. Praise be to God this morning. Amen. Y'all can sit down if you want to. I'm just letting you know. I, since 5.30 this morning, I've been on one. I just need y'all to know that this morning. It is good to be with y'all. You can sit down. It's good to be with y'all here this morning. I want to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and meet me in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We are about to slide into home plate this morning. Uh, mamas, I want y'all to know that uh, screaming babies don't bother me. Crying babies don't bother me. They don't bother us. I love the sound of children in a worship service because it means there's life in our church. Uh, So you feel free to let that baby crawl. Debbie, you let that baby crawl. He's okay. You let him cry. Um, We are honored to have them here this morning. I'm going to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be in verses 21 through 24 as we finish our sermon series in Ephesians this morning. And I was asking our staff this week um, if like, or a couple weeks ago, I was like, hey, like, is this... Has the series been stale? I know we've been in it for a long time, and I don't know if people are still interested. Is, this, is it helpful to folks? And they were like, you think this is a long series? We were in Matthew for three years. Um, some of y'all remember when Pastor Crawford taught through the book of Matthew with some periodic breaks here and there. Uh, we're grateful for him and his commitment to the word, and I'm grateful to have finished this morning, finished this, the first book we've walked through together here as a church. Um, I'm going to read our text, and then I'm going to spend some extended time in a pastoral prayer, a lot of things happening in and around the world, and so I want to spend some time praying for that. Uh, But I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 21 through 24 first. So when you get to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, give me an oh yeah. If you need a minute, say hold up, brother. I don't think you know how to flip in a Bible, boss. That's mine, by the way. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21 reads, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And before considering it, we should pray. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I am grateful and thankful for your presence. For it has been my balm all week when after the last two weeks, the song of my soul has been, how long, O Lord? as we watch innocence brutally cut down by evil in Uvalde, Texas this week, Father. I found myself at a loss for words, praying prayers with groanings too deep for words and asking, how will you redeem this? I don't know, but Spirit of God, you do. And you have your way. And Uvalde and those parents and those teachers. Father, the ground that the enemy has tried to take, would you reclaim? And would you somehow work this for victory? Father, I was reminded this week as the last of the victims shot in that grocery store in Buffalo were laid to rest, that you do not allow us 
to grieve without hope. For all of those who have placed their hope in the finished work of Christ Jesus understand that death is a promotion and yet it still hurts. And yet we are still confused. Would you help us in our confusion? Help us in our grief. Father, help that community to be all that you have called them to be and even more begin to restore and to replace. Father, I pray for the Mikuluks in the Ukraine as things ramp up there, would you strengthen our brother and sister? Would you strengthen the work of their hands? Would you lift their drooping hands and strengthen their drooping knees? And would you give them resolve to fight? They've been so faithful and you've not allowed it to go unseen. Father, as the threat of death still looms, I pray that you would strengthen them, give them courage and faith, continue to keep them uplifted. I thank you for new life and that baby. Would you give and allow her to have all that she needs? Lord, I'm reminded now that we are asked by you to not only respect and honor our governors and officials, but to pray for them. So Lord, I do lift up our president. I do lift up our governor, all state and local officials. And Father, would you grant them the wisdom to lead and rule in how you ordained And in the ways that they stray away from that, Father, would you with holy rebuke and godly grief and correction, move them off and away from those ways and into the way, your way everlasting. And Lord, we remember Paul, our very own brother right now. Would you allow his anxieties to be few? Would you give him increased capacity to trust you in these new experiences? And Father, I pray that you would Uh, Allow my brother to be filled with joy at the work that you have set before him. And finally, we remember those who have offered and given their lives to defend the freedoms of this country. And Father, we remember them on this Memorial Day weekend, those who have gone before and who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, thank you that you have sent them for the purposes ordained. And Father, it reminds me that freedom is not free. And moreover, Jesus, our freedom with you and God came at a great price. So would you keep our eyes fixed on our freedom, but on the one who paid it all, and that is you, Jesus. So this morning, as we come before your word, Lord, would you bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of your word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we ask. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. I was thinking of a story I heard this week of a young man who was called to his grandfather's presence. His grandfather said, son, I need you to take this bag across town to this address. It was a brown paper bag, felt really light, nondescript. He said, I don't want you to open it until you get there, but I want you to take this paper bag, this brown paper bag, across town to this address. You'll know why you're there when you get there. So he gets the paper bag and he hops on his bike and he throws the bag in the basket in front of his bike. He's riding down the street and he sees some of his friends, so he stops off to play. And when you're in a hurry, you know, sometimes like you just throw your bike down. So he throws his bike down and the package rolls out on the ground and he's there playing with his buddies. It's probably marbles or pogs, if you remember those. It's a millennial joke. It's okay. Nobody got it. You did. Thank you for laughing. Um, but he gets out of his bike and he's playing and buddy of his accidentally steps on the bag and kind of rustles it over. So he plays for a little bit and he gets back up. He puts the bag, he throws the bag back in the basket and he keeps running. He, he's dry, uh, riding down the street on his bike and he gets to an uh, intersection. He's trying to gun the bike across the intersection and he uh, pedals so fast that this bag comes out of the basket and a car runs over it and he looks it up and it's all crumpled. It's got tire marks on it and he throws it back in his bag and he keeps riding. Eventually he gets to the address his grandfather tells him. Well, he gets there and his grandmother walks out of the store. He's like, Granny, what are you doing here? She says, well, don't you have something for me? He's like, uh, yeah, so he reaches and he gets this bag and it's waterlogged and soggy and it's all dirty. And he gives it to her and she opens it up and she pulls out of this bag her engagement ring from 40 years previous. And he stares at the ring with eyes wide open and says, if I'd have known that was in there, I would have taken better care of it. And I think about Tychicus, who's been sitting 
in this hole in this Roman prison dictating this letter from Paul? Did he know what was in his possession as he left to run to the Ephesian church? Did he know the jewel that he possessed, the power, or is it just us on this side of it who get to realize just how amazing this letter is? And here at the end of this book, it gives us an opportunity to look back at all the ground that we've covered and to find hope and strength in this benediction of what Paul is asking us to do now that we've walked through this book in nine months. As Christians, the good Christian impulse is that we are both those who reflexively look ahead and backwards. Before Christians begin anything, we have the end in mind. We count the cost and have the end in mind. And at the same time, we're always returning back to the beginning for where the story is anchored is how we find our place in it. At the very beginning of the sermon series, back in September 2021, I preached an overview of the book where I gave you the following, and I just want to run through them again. Because this not only reminds us where we've been, but it also gives us an idea of what God might be calling us to today in this benediction. That very first sermon, I summed up Ephesians in a sentence. And here's what I said. I said that Ephesians is about spiritual maturity unto God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, grows as the gospel informs and transforms our whole lives into Christ Jesus within intercultural community. That the entire book is about growing up by the Spirit's power uh, as a result of the gospel as it transforms not just our souls, but all of us into Christ Jesus. The gospel is not only a spiritual thing. It has very real practical applications. And God is concerned about your soul, yes, but he's also concerned about all other things. For that reason, we get into chapter two, and, uh, or chapter one rather, and the one sentence summary of chapter one is that here in chapter one, we see that you, there's the uniting of all things by and under Jesus Christ. Paul sends his thesis for the entire letter in verse 10 of chapter one, that Christ unites all things under heaven and earth. He unites all things, all people together. That first sermon series, we entitled Finding Yourself, and you would have seen this, and this has been a long time, but uh, you would have seen this, and see the icon there with the thumbnail. That entire series was about finding yourself and your identity, that in chapter one, there are like 20 different identity statements concerning who we are in Christ Jesus. You're loved, you're adopted, you're justified, you're predestined, you're chosen, et cetera, et cetera. He goes on and on and on and on. That's who you are. In chapter one, Paul sets the tone and says, we are one family, but in order to be one family, we gotta have a common identity. And the common identity has less to do with culture and it has more to do with Christ and his affirmations of you. In chapter two, we read in chapter two, the one sentence summary is that in chapter two, we see a uniting sinners to God by grace through faith and unto one another, forming one new man. The idea of us becoming one new man. Now this is tough because as we talked about before, some of y'all spool your toilet paper the wrong way, right? Some of y'all still spooling it over the bottom. It's meant to go over the top. Uh, some of y'all think, think peeps are actually edible food. Uh, I pray for y'all. I actually had a man bring me a whole pack of blue peeps after Bible study about four weeks ago. Um, if it wasn't for the spirit of God in me, I would have thrown up on him. But instead, I received his gift. Some of y'all think peeps are good. Yo, what are we doing? It's the year of our Lord, 2022. <laughs> peeps is nasty, yo. Can we just leave them alone? Amen. Some of y'all still eating your barbecue with sauce on it. If, it's, if the meat is right, you don't need no sauce. Season the meat better. <laughs> That's why we need Jesus. Do you feel it? There are so many different ways that we are splintered and we're not only individuals, but we are one family. So we're united, forming one new man. The graphic for that sermon series in terms of one new man, the icon is the uh, Model T Ford. And the Model T Ford was to the horse and buggy what the church is post-Christ to pre-Christ, meaning that you're riding around on horses all the time. All of a sudden, somebody comes with a car that's riding down the street. They think you're riding in a spaceship. In the same way, there is a peculiarness to a church 
There's a distinctive uniqueness. You could even say a weirdness to the church. It should look and feel different than the world because we are one new person. In chapter three, we get to the point where we see the revealing of God's mystery of Gentile inclusion as a witness to the manifold wisdom of God. God's wisdom, his crazy great wisdom is that he would make Jew and Gentile part of the same family. Part of the same family. That's crazy. Enemies, not just sharing space, but sharing blood. Enemies, not just sharing clothes, sharing a table, sharing a meal. Enemies bound with God as father. When the world would have saw that, they would have thought, not only is that crazy, but all of the heavens look on and peer in wonder because what they're seeing, they can't believe it. It's why when we got to the sermon art icon, uh, we, there's a picture. The icon is of a curtain being pulled back. And as that curtain is being pulled back, it is the mystery that had been hidden before time is being revealed. It's this beautiful picture that we get insight into something that angels themselves long to peer in. Paul says that all of this stuff with the church is oneness, it's a mystery. And then in chapter four, we, get, we move on from uh, a doxa, or excuse me, um, um, a doctrine and theology, what we might call orthodoxy in chapters one, two, and three, to chapters four, five, and six into orthopraxy. Chapters one, two, and three, here's right belief. Now let's put that belief in action. Chapter four, the one sentence summary is that Christian maturity is lived out in the local church and evident through life change over time. Paul in chapter four is encouraging these believers to continue to press on and serve Jesus. In other words, like don't go back to what life was like before. Don't go back. I use the illustration of uh, soccer, little kids soccer match. You guys remember that illustration? Um, when you've got kids in a soccer match, uh, in the words of Groucho Marx, if you've heard this before, please don't stop me. I'd very much so like to hear it again. Um, in the words of some of the old heads in my, uh, in my culture, you like to hear it? Here, here it go, right? So you got kids in a soccer game. They come to the game. They got shin guards up to their hips and jerseys that are down to their ankles. And before the game starts, you got kids all over the place, some kids eating grass, other kids picking their... Knows you got two kids that are just kicking each other in the shins the whole time. Um, you got one kid who's at the goalpost trying to hide because they want to be anywhere else except for on the soccer field. Whistle's blown, they all come, and in the first half of the game, all the parents and the coach are like, run that way. The goal is that way, run that way. So all the kids, the first half, they start running this way, and they're all snotting and, and crying and tripping over each other and kicking each other in the shins, and then halftime comes. And they pass out goldfish and they pass out um, fruit punch and everybody's got the uh, stains all over their face and their jerseys. And then the second half, they flip sides of the field. So now they're having to run this way. The problem is you just spent 20 minutes telling them to run this way. So everything that's in them wants to run this way. So now parents and coaches spend the next 20 minutes trying to get them to run this way. And the Christian life is before Jesus arrests our hearts and we follow the ways that we want to, as Paul says, the prince of the power of the air, we are running headlong into sin according to the flesh. And we are running away from the things of God. And then Jesus comes and turns us around. And he's like, no, this is my way. It's a better way. Walk this way. But everything in us wants to go back. Paul says, don't go back. Don't turn around. In fact, this new life that's yours, put away all of the things that would even tempt you to go back and press on forward. This is why in the graphic that we had that week, it was two feet next to each other to signify us walking worthy of the calling that we've received. Walk in the path that God by Christ has ordained for you. Chapter six, um, or chapter five, rather. Uh, chapter five got a little dicey. Uh, chapter five, remember, it was kind of like skipping through a minefield with explosions going off, and the whole time the soundtrack was, wouldn't it be nice if we could wake up in the morning when the day, and just had the bombs was going off everywhere. That's how I felt preaching through chapter five. The Lord helped us. Praise be to God. But chapter five, the one sentence summary is that mature Christians, mature Christians imitate God through holy lives, mutual submission, and divinely ordered families. For those who are mature, it shows itself in maturity when we live according to how God has us to live within the church. And Paul uses four pictures to illustrate that. He used husbands and wives 
He used children and parents. He used slaves and masters. I said four, that's six different illustrations. I can't count, six. Six illustrations to illustrate what our lives together are like, meaning this thing is not just an intellectual exercise. God has called us to actually live this out within the context of the church. And for that graphic and that sermon series, the icon were uh, some row houses that would signify house rules. So now we're in a house together. We got to live together, you and I. Some of y'all had some home training and some of y'all didn't. Some of y'all still don't lift the toilet seat up. Some of y'all still don't pick trash up off the floor. Some of y'all still leave your plate on the table after you get done eating. We don't have to talk about it. And in the family of God, what does it look like to be new? Yes, it's great to be one new reconciled people. Now we got to figure out how to live together, which is the present enterprise of the local church. And all of this is important because sixth and finally, we are in a spiritual battle. And this spiritual battle requires spiritual armaments donned and used in warfare alongside a belligerent community. Belligerent there means warring, a warring community. We are a fighting community together. So remember, we all got the sword. We got the arm of the Lord on, right? We got, we got our sword. Don't make me bring it out because it's kind of scary and it's real heavy. But we got our sword. We got our shields up and we're fighting together. Remember, your shield covers half of you and half of the person next to you. So if you choose not to fight, somebody's getting hit. And Paul says, you, the church, are like a Roman phalanx where you're fighting together because everything outside of you wants to destroy you. Don't allow what's in here destroy this. And then we get to this benediction finally. And my admonishment for us this, this, this morning is that the invitation here is to be like Tychicus. Well, what do you mean? There are a couple things. I wonder if Tychicus knew the letter that he was carrying with him. And I wonder if Tychicus himself understood what he had in his possession. Because Paul was sending it through Tychicus because Tychicus was faithful. Tychicus himself was to be a messenger, but also he was to be an encourager. He was faithful. Paul mentions Tychicus elsewhere throughout his epistles as someone who could be counted on and trusted to take the word and deliver it. He was also one who was a minister. He wanted uh, Paul to know how uh, that the Ephesian church was okay, but the Ephesian church needed to know that Paul was good too. But third, he was an encourager. And this word kind of struck me this week, that he might encourage your hearts. Friends, if you feel like you're in a battle, it's because you are. And if there's one thing the church needs a whole lot more of, it is encouragement. I think about where we are and many of us just need to hear, hey, you're doing a good job. Or many of us need to be encouraged by the spirit or in our song, in our souls of lamentation, be encouraged by the psalms of lament and lamentation. There's an opportunity to be encouraged. And as I consider where we've been, I pray that this book has indeed been and encouragement to us because the reality is, last graphic, the reality is in this last sermon series, the reality is that we are stronger together and we strive and wrestle with all of the power that God gives, Ephesians 6, 1. We're in this thing together. And so over the last nine months, as we've walked through this book together, my hope and prayer has been, God, would you change us as a church to be more like this? And I believe by his grace, he has and is and will continue to do that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the ways in which it is a salve to us, an encouragement to us. But I thank you for the way that it's changing us. I thank you for the way it's changing me. As we continue to interrogate and figure out and live uh, this word out, I pray that you would help us by your spirit. Would you give us strength and power and aid in our fight? And help us to be the church that you've called us to be. An intergenerational and intercultural community that has you, Christ Jesus, as our most important aim. Lord, we love you. It's your name we pray. And all God's people say it. Amen. We're going to sing this last song together. If you don't mind standing at this time. See you.
said the Lord is good. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Those of you who are online and those of you who are here, uh, we have, I love when we get to worship as a family, as loud and crazy as it is, it mirrors what life is kind of really like. Uh, so thanks for being here with us this morning. Our benediction is going to be a little different to sum up where we've been and where hopefully the Lord is calling us. There's a prayer I'd like for us to read together that sort of encapsulates this benediction we talked about today, but also sends us out on our way. So we're going to read this together. Let's read the word of the Lord together. May peace mark us, love bind us, faith guard us, and grace guide us until the Lord returns. Come, Lord Jesus, in the name of God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the grace and the peace of the Lord. We love you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you, Pastor Jason. If during today's message, God spoke to you and you would like to learn a little bit more about what a life with Jesus can look like, we would love to talk to you about that. Will you please go to fellowshiproswell.org connect, fill out your information there, and one of our team members will be in touch with you shortly. If you are going through a rough season, a rough patch, and you want to talk to someone or pray with someone, uh, you need some encouragement, will you please go to fellowshiproswell.org pray, Fill out your information there, and one of our ministry care team members will be in touch with you. And while you're there, you can also set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with them, whether that's in person here in our campus uh, or through a video conference call. Well, it's been a wonderful morning together, and I pray that this week uh, you do not forget that you are a much-loved child of the Most High King. God bless you.